Ladies and gentlemen, many thanks to the organizers for this Congress, especially for showing the film yesterday, La Cristiada, under which um, I, I, I'm still under, under the impression of this film, and, and I think it was a wonderful, um, wonderful event yesterday evening, and to see that, and to see the reaction of the Spanish people here in Madrid. And a special thanks to inviting me to speak to such a large and prestigious crowd. I really feel honored to speak here in Madrid, the birthplace of my dearest wife, Pilar Mendez de Vigo. Even though Spanish is the most beautiful language on the lips of four of my children, because the last one is only three weeks old and only speaks the universal language of crying, <laughs> I will talk to you in English out of two reasons. Because, first of all, um, if I speak to you in Spanish, neither you nor the translators will understand a single word of what I'm trying to say. And second, because Spanish words have half long the corresponding German words, but are still double size of the same English words. Therefore, by speaking to you in English, I will be able to transmit you twice as much ideas. And I think this question of Christianophobia deserves an in-depth anal analysis. And we will hear from the podium, and we heard already many of these uh, thoughts. Today, the list of incidents involving religious persecution, primarily Christians, grows daily. There are many in-depth publications reporting these incidents. Let me refer just to Church in Need, uh, with a, I think it's a yearly day book, a yearly, a yearly um, a black book of, of persecution, and the report of Gudrun Kugler of her Observatory of Discrimination Against Christians in Europe. This grave state of affairs prompted Bishop Dominique Martini, Mamberti, Vatican Secretary of Foreign Relations with States, to propose establishing a World Day Against Persecution and Discrimination of Christians. So we all wonder, why are they discriminating and persecuting Christian, Christians? The reasons are many and depend on the religious and cultural background of the persecutors. In the case of the open killings of Christians in the hands of Islamists, it is necessary to remember that Islam is a religion of submission. Islam means submission. And for Islamists, it doesn't matter whether this submission is internal and sincere or external and fake submission to, of someone paying lip service to the Quran. This external submission can also be obtained by means of violence. The Quran divides the world between Dar al-Islam, the country of submission, and Dar al-Harb, the country of war. And that is why almost every single page of the Quran calls to violence against the infidels. Thus, a literal interpretation of Quran necessarily leads to violence against Christian. If we consider the Hindu persecution of Christians, I believe our brothers in India are primarily the victims of a nationalistic wave that is aggravated by the clash of civilization between India's Muslims and Hindus that has been brewing since the independence from British rule. As Christians are a tiny, weak minority, it is easier to accuse them of forced or bribed conversions or to hold them responsible for the attacks against Hindu radical leaders, which are in fact committed by other groups, as in Orissa. A more subtle form of persecution is the one waged against Christian and other religions by the communist states. The most obvious case is China. The communist party must control all aspects of political, economic, social, and cultural life, including religion. To this end, the Chinese government has the infamous State Administration for Religious Affairs, charged with overseeing the, operation, the operations of China's five officially sanctioned religious organizations. Even though part of an atheist regime, this department exercises full control over religious appointments, the selection of clergy, 
and even the interpretation of religious doctrine. The reason for this communist intervention is to ensure, ensure that the registered religious organization support and carry out the policy priorities of the Chinese Communist Party, like the Maoist one-child policy that led to the extradition of blind dissident Chen Guacheng and his family to the USA, in spite of Obama's and Clinton, Clinton's unsupportive attitudes. To turn religion into an instrument of its totalitarian policies, communist authorities provoke internal divisions between faithful followers of a given religion and their fellow brothers in the pew who are manipulated by the infiltrators. Cardinal Sen, former Archbishop of Hong Kong, has denounced the naive optimism of those who think it is better to shake the deceitful hand extended by the communist authorities rather than to courageously go underground. We saw yesterday in this wonderful film how faithful these atheists are to their words. And when the shepherds themselves are those who shake hands with the communist authorities, then you have the terrible situation we recently witnessed in Cuba where the Archbishop of Havana himself asked the police to repress, repress Catholic dissidents clamoring for freedom. However, the first prize in this championship of deceit does not go to the communist regimes, but to our own secular pseudo-democratic states in the West. So-called secular states do not take open control of religious bodies, but nonetheless impose state policy as a doctrine. In the name of today's higher law, and by this I mean so-called human rights. Not the real, unchangeable fundamental rights of the human person, but rather a subjective, relativistic, and evolving version. A version that allows unthinkable aberrations, like killing a baby in the name of a supposed right of the mother to do what she, what she pleases with her own body, even going so far as to kill the baby after birth in the name of the right to health or happiness. Or the supposed right to follow one's unnatural sexual orientation and to have all the privileges of, an unmarried, of a married couple, including the adoption of children for unnatural unions. Or even the supposed right to define oneself as male or female at one's own discretion, regardless of one's physiological sex and without sex re reassignment, surgery, or hormonal treatment. All of this is done in the name of the gender experience as each person feels it. As stated in the gender identity law recently approved 55 by nil by the Argentinian state. This new human rights dogma and by its product called and its byproduct called the fight against discrimination pressures Christians to act in public life against their own convictions even though all democratic constitution uh, constitutions pay lip service to the right to conscientious object, objection. Thus, Christian hospitals and health personnel have to perform immoral acts, such, such as sterilization surgeries or provide abortion pills. Christian public servants have to bless unnatural unions, unions as marriages. Christian sh schools have to admit openly homosexual or transsexual teachers. Parents have to allow their children to be brainwashed with immoral sex education programs. And if they decide to educate them up at home, the education department will ensure their teaching is not homophobic. The irony of all this is that we are supposed to live in an era of human history considered to be the most tolerant ever. What we have instead is the dictatorship of relativism, many times denounced by Pope Benedict. This dictatorship of relativism is the worst and most insidious form of religious persecution because it forces us Christians to cultivate an attitude of openness, a positive interest of for alternative lifestyles, to accept someone else's diversity, to enrich our personality with his opposing viewpoint. Such an internal renunciation of our own conviction is tantamount to apostasy, because faith consists precisely in firmly holding as true on God's own authority everything he has revealed to us. This is incompatible with a permanent or even transistory attitude of voluntary doubt. 
Sacralist tolerance thus incites us to abandon our Christian faith in order to be part of the festival of diversities that our modern democracy pretends to be. In doing so, the modern sacralist state unleashes a more insidious persecution than that of the Islamist, radical Hindus, or even communist regimes. Already in the 60s, Professor Plinio Correa de Oliveira, founder of the first Society for the Defense of Tradition, Family, and Property, used to say that this revolutionary period would lead to the greatest religious persecution of history. We are witnessing the fulfillment of his forecast. Now, instead of succumbing to this persecution, we must fight back with increasing ardor within the legal framework. We have a responsibility not only to ourselves, but to society as a whole. Because eliminating God from the public square will turn our society into an inhuman world, a world which is against life, against nature, a more totalitarian regime than those of the 20th century. We must take this course to the street. Pope Benedict repeatedly asked us Catholics to be visible, to bear witness to our faith in public so as to motivate the scattered moral majority. Our great ideal is to rebuild the Christian civilization from the ruins of the modern world, just as the medieval world arose from the ruins of the Roman Empire. This is not a dream. This is not a fantasy, for we have the support of heaven. Our most holy and heavenly blessed, blessed mother, uh, heavenly mother, the blessed Virgin Mary, promised us as Fatima that in the end, her immaculate heart will triumph. But she wants our help, so let us get up and move, and she will add whatever is missing. Viva Christo Rei. <laughs>